Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 13th Time for a Pint Virtual Get Together. I am Chris. Hello. I am joined by my co-host, Matt, who is on my left. Morning. I don't know where he is on your screen. Um, do you want to introduce the guest, Matt? I would. I would. I'm going to introduce someone who I have known for a long time, over a dozen years, I think. In the early days of Twitter, uh, I first met Felix, along with a couple of um, other Australian watchnets. And um, Felix was in that very, very early early stage of, uh, of Watch Nerdy and Team Watch Nerd. He's obviously gone on to do much greater and, and, and better things than I, um, and is currently um, uh, running with his, uh, with his co-host, the OT Podcast, um, but remains a freelance writer and has written for quite a few magazines, I'm sure all of us have read, and obviously um, was involved in Time and Tide as well in Australia. So welcome, welcome, Felix. It's great to be here. It's a pleasure. Thanks for joining Good way us. to spend a Sunday evening. Good. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Do you want me uh, to just, are you want to, well, that was it. We'll, we'll do go over Roman now. You can go home yeah, now. You're good. See you later. See you later. Read a drop. Uh, and I'm pleased to introduce Roman. He is a collector of interesting independent watches, a member of the Fifth Wrist podcast crew. Uh, he is a freeman of the worshipful company of clockmakers. We established he is one of two currently in Australia. Um, so if there is the uh, news of the mysterious death of the other one in the newspapers over the next few weeks, we know what he's been up to. Uh, welcome along, Roman. <laughs> Hi, guys. Pleasure to be here. Thanks again for the invite. This should be great fun. Thanks for joining us. Um, should we dive straight in? We'll have a look at some watches. Uh, for anyone who has been here before, you hopefully know how this works. For anybody who's new, you maybe don't. So let me explain super quickly. You have the chat function. You can send messages to each other. You can talk to us as panelists. Uh, you can be super nerdy and um, demand that nobody eats radium. I'm getting in there before Kathleen this week. There's no radium in any of the watches. Um, uh, and there's a Q&A function. So if you have a question for one of the panelists, please use the Q&A function. Matt's going to be keeping an eye on the Q&A and the chat because I'm going to be sharing my screen and running a slide deck. Um, we're going to go through an order. So it's going to go Felix, Roman, Matt, me. We've got a watch each to talk about. You can ask us questions as we're talking um, and Matt will uh, pop those questions in as each of us has finished talking about our watches. Um, and then if we have a bit of time at the end, we'll talk about some other stuff. Um, but yeah, super relaxed. But let's get into it and see what happens. So, uh, just sharing this now. Felix, you are up first, sir. Just tell me when you want me to click through. Uh, well, yeah, you might as well go to the, you've given it away, the big reveal. Uh, the Anne Ordain Model 2 uh, is the watch I've chosen today because I'm, unlike yourselves and unlike maybe some of the people watching, I don't really consider myself a collector of watches. I just sort of, uh, have a few that I wear and I have gradually sort of um, uh, narrowed down what I like and I tend to like simple practical functional watches at a at a certain you know level uh, and this Anodane Model 2 fits all of them but the biggest so I got this in 2019 I originally got it to review uh, and did the sneaky thing of reviewing it and saying hello Anodane can I please uh, you know, not send it back to you. Let's let's make this official. Um, and it's 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 really it's one of those watches that that, that grabbed me from the start. So obviously, An Ordain they're based in Glasgow. Maybe not obviously. They're based in Glasgow and they're a, a small crew, but they're remarkable for doing enamel dials themselves. Um, but that's not the only thing that they do. Like to to say. We do an adult dials ourselves. That's that's something that a lot of uh, you will know about. That's the main um, selling point, I guess. But they are a bit more impressive than that on a few other levels as well, because it's really considered watch design, and there's lots of other thoughtful details that many brands that are sort of uh, at a similar level of maturity or you know price tend to miss. So. That's a quick, I don't know, 10 second spiel on Anne Ordain. Uh, but the watch itself, so it's a, it's a field style watch. You know, it's pretty pretty robust steel, manually winding. Um, the Salida base, you know, sort of manual wound movement. But the, the kicker for me is that it's 36 millimeters. Now, I've worn 36 in the past, but not for a while. I te typically tend to be, you know, floating around 40 these days, like a lot of people. 
uh, and go up to 44. But I reckon, uh, in this photo you can see, I've got like a 22 centimetre wrist. Uh, and I think the 36, I find it wears pretty well and it doesn't look too small. It's a, but it's sort of a weird psychological thing getting used to it. Like uh, there's, there's less watch on your wrist. Like I'm used to sort of having a bit more presence. Um, so can we go to the next picture, which I think will sort of be a bit more detail on the dial. So that is the dial, which looks very different. <laughs> um, which looks quite different here from the previous one. So this is a color they call moss green uh, and all of their colors allegedly are inspired by the Highlands of Scotland. Um, it's been, in fact, I've never been to the Highlands of Scotland. I've been to Scotland um, a long time ago. I can't uh, vouch for how authentic the colour range is, but it does look quite mossy. Um, and if you're sort of getting close to it, uh, there's some shots. Uh, if you Google, you know, uh, an Anodad Model 2, you'll find some shots of this this watch that uh, show it in beautiful macro, just how how much variation there is in the, the, the enamel dial. But the other things I wanted to point out about this, uh, in this photo, are particularly the hands and the numerals. So something else that I like about Anodane is that one of their first hires was a typographer, um, which I think is very important. Um, so it's an in-house font that they've got for the numerals, which is really, really lovely. So I don't know if you can quite tell on this image, but it's a uh, blue stencil, with a white sort of infill printed onto the dial, not luminous. Um, that's, that's, I find it's sort of, it's, it's a lovely mix of, you know, vaguely deco. Oh, well, there we go. It was a lady designer. How uncommonly non-Swiss. Uh, it's, it's a lovely sort of deco, but modern vibe. And I think it was inspired by Ordnance Survey maps. Um, so that's the that's the the font. That's the first thing I wanted to point out about uh, in this image. The other thing is the hands. So they're a so they're a syringe style hand, and the, the the sort of the pips at the end are actually super luminova, which is charming but pointless. Um, it will be visible for maybe three seconds in a pitch black room, and after that, uh, you know, it's not really legibility per se. But, but the thing that I found most remarkable about the, dial, the hands rather, is that they needed to use two suppliers to produce them. Um, I think most companies when working out the extra co the costs uh, on that would have said, no, no, let's just go without, you know, this feature and get one guy to do it. Um, but no, they've gone with two. I think the most recent generation of the Model 1 is using a different design hand. I don't know if they've updated the Model 2 yet, but I imagine they will iterate on it. And as someone said, I think it was Matt in the chat, the branding is super subtle. So you've got Anodane at the top. Yeah, and the it's bottom, beautiful. It says, yeah. And at the bottom, it's got vitreous enamel. And now they're moving to a model where uh, some of their retailers are starting to have co-branded watches. So I think you'll see James Porter uh, in Scotland and the Armoury have their own uh, logo type down the bottom. So the Armoury has an Armoury logo at six. And I think it's a really nice, uh, you know, that double signed thing is, is quite cool. And it's uh, certainly at a scale where it's not too hard for them to do that. Like it's not, you know, out of the realm of possibility. Uh, can we go on to the next slide? What do we got next? Oh yeah, look, there's there's someone making some enamel. Um, yeah, they do all their enamel in-house, which is, I think, super impressive for such a small, small company. Uh, they're currently not doing it because, you know, they're all working at home, uh, you know, because of, you know, lockdowns and all that. But apparently enamel is too dangerous to, to do, so they can't do that at the moment. So they've had to slow production, which I think means that if you're rushing off to buy one, you'll be facing a bit longer of a wait. So there you go, there's someone making enamel. And it's they've got beautiful color ranges like teal. Uh, and after the, uh, after I got this one, I sort of knew it was in the works, but the, the thing that sort of got a lot of attention late last year was their use of Fume sort of style enamel, which is quite really stunning. <laughs> 
uh, and certainly don't don't lick the tools that you they put the enamel into the oven with. That'll be hot. <laughs> um, yeah, that's right. So they, yeah, they can't they can't do the enamel at home. But so there's only limits to how you know how fast they can produce. So next image, please. What do we got here? Oh yeah. So proving two things here. Uh, if you sort of if you can see uh, at the bottom of the dial, you see some of the richness of the texture. You also see my backyard and the unmown lawn in the background, but also it gives it a bit of a different look. So you can sort of see it on a NATO strap and it gives it a, a bit of that fieldy vibe, which I don't know. I typically find field watches quite boring because they're all, you know, black and military and, and you know, the same. So anyone that can take that genre and make it interesting, I am all for. So yeah, I really love this. I like the little cutaway so, actually, this uh, between the where the lug joins the case, just a tiny little chamfering kind of internal angle. Yeah, the and the other thing that's the other thing that's really nice is the the crown. Like that's really it's been it's got you know sort of subtle guards, but it's really inset. Is so it easy underneath a, just to pull it back out again? Though is it? Yeah, there's a there's a sort of yeah, it's quite clear at yeah. the bottom to to use yeah. your fingernail to pull it out, uh, and you know you've got to wind it every every day or so, so that's there's no issues there. Um, it's really cool and the yeah, dip again you can see the dip in the center of the dial as well that kind of just where the enamel is just collected inside yeah it's, mm. it's it's great it's uh it's unlike i don't i don't know what it is i don't know if it's the fact that they've done it themselves and they're not using you know or comparing themselves to the other sort of swiss guides or whatever but it is a very different mm. style of enamel it's, it seems to be you know they're using different colors and it's it's there's a bit more texture and gray you know sort of almost grain in in the dials i've seen at least so yeah i think yeah, adding that surface check yeah keeping that surface texture is really interesting we had um it's, a speak marin on a couple of weeks ago and that has a few kind of you know it's it's not entirely flat but it's not that milled lacquer you get either you know this is a as you said this is this is yeah. kind of really interesting in terms of texture yeah so I, I think the, the thing that I, I, I most take about, I know I'm sort of getting up to that, that 15 minute mark, so I'll sort of keep it pretty brief. The thing that I no, like- no, you can keep talking as long as you want, mate. Oh, oh great, 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 great. I'll talk less, um, mate. Just take 30. Oh, no, no, you, no, no, no. I think Roman's, Roman's got a lot to say. Um, Usually. Is, <laughs> is, <laughs> both podcasters, so you should be used to this. So this watch, it's 950 pounds, I think, unless they've gone up in price. You know, depending on the price. version. You think they have? Yeah, I think, I think they're about think... 1,500 to 1,800 nowadays, but... I think it's 950 for this dial. No, I think it's for the Fume dials are a bit more. So yeah. I think uh, Fume, sorry, price, that's right. Yeah. I was looking at Fume, that's right, yeah. Fume's 1,500. So this guy on a leather strap, 950 plus of that. Bloody hell, that's amazing. Um, yeah, no, that's amazing. And it's for me, what I, I find most uh, interesting is how they've done this. So it's an exercise in, you know, the economics of a watch. So the case is pretty simple. Like the finishing is pretty, uh, you know, utilitarian. I guess. Honest. The, 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 honest. The strap honest. is nice. So the, the, the orange strap it came on, it's like goat or camel or something. It's a Salida, manual amount of Salida. You don't need anything more. It, all the value is the dial and the hands. And I think that's absolutely the right thing. But it's, it's, that doesn't mean that I've seen watches where they're beautiful dials, but they're put in in a boring stock case and it doesn't really work. I think the whole package here works. So uh, what have I got next? What's the next picture? Oh yeah, profile. So there you go. There's a, a shot of the profile. Closed case back as well. You don't need to see a manually wound Salida. Hide that away. Um, I would have liked drilled lugs, uh, and I would have liked 20 mil lugs, but that's, you know, my own cross to bear. Uh, what's Model the next three. one? I think we've got the case back. Yeah, there you go. Look at that, the case back. You don't need anything else. Good proportion, so nice. Fat, meaty lugs. Uh, and what have I got next? Oh, the other thing I like, I think I've got the packaging next. <coughs> Excuse me. So can we go into like live mode? So you can see my face. Yeah, sure. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, the other thing I was really impressed by is the packaging. So a 950 pound watch comes in that lovely box, which has this, uh, this schmancy little travel case in there, uh, which is sort of similar to what Nomos are using now. And I've seen a few other brands. So it's not, you know, they've not made it themselves, but um, 
you know, really good. It's a really lovely case for the price. And I think that that sort of, I've bought enough watches like this and it comes in like a fairly janky box or whatever. This was one where I'm like, oh, wow. It came in a like paper wrapped ordnance survey style. The presentation from a, like a, a high-end retail point of view was clearly thought out and it was really, uh, yeah, great. Sigh. Uh, yeah, so that's, I think, what's the next shot? I think it's back to slideshow. It's just another shot of the watch, but um, I don't think I have anything else to really say. Yeah, apologies for the sigh there, Felix. That wasn't sighing at you. That was sighing at, sighing at Kathleen. We, okay, we have an in-joke running about time for a box where we accidentally got into some pretty deep dives about boxes. But we it won't do no, it again. It was no point. accident. It was no accident. <laughs> it was intentional. I love this thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna step away from this discussion that clearly I'm not aware of. I, well, you don't, look, I wouldn't bother trying to catch up. It'll take you, it'll take sure. you like fifteen so th minutes. So that's it. Does anyone uh, want to know anything about this watch? There are. So, as you can see from the chat, people are just, just loving the proportions. They're loving the, um, yeah, uh, the topography, well, the squareness, the squareness of the spaces within the numerals. Chris Andrews points out. I think he's right. There's like that rectangle. If you look at the six and the eight in particular, um, yeah, and squared off top and bottom to each of the each of the gaps. Lee's on board, so he'll tell us what those gaps are called, I'm sure. Uh, Lee, one hour watch, our in-house topographer. Yeah, they've they've well, introduced sorry, custom engravings, designer. haven't they? Uh, so you can get what you want. Custom engravings. Yes, either wording or even a map, even a map reference, if you type in sort of your oh, location. Yes, you even do, yeah. It's very cool. And it's no, at, at no extra charge as well. No I mean, they're, they're kicking major goals. Cool. I'm a big fan as well. Lee points um, out that those those spacing that the space between well sorry within numerals and letters are called counters. Um, so someone quick, welcome asked, to oh, Bill Soane. Uh, I was about yeah, it's probably going to ask the same, same one. Bill Soane's asked what movements in it. Uh, whatever the Salida version of the manually wound Edda two eight two four is. So I think it's a uh, yeah I don't know it's a manually wound entry level Salida. Uh, and someone okay. else asked about Australian ads. No, no, no one in. No one in Australia. I think Hong Kong's possibly the closest. You could deal with them directly and they, they'll readily sh ship. I mean, I didn't realize Felix was going to talk about an, an ordain because coincidentally, I have one as well. Um, I've got a model one, which, um, yeah, which Lewis had actually, Lewis at an ordain happily shipped to me. So like, they're awesome yeah. guys to deal with. I, I can only yeah, echo what Felix what, said. They're fantastic. That's sort of my, my point around that, you know, I was impressed by the, the level of care that went into that sort of shipped uh, experience. It was a, you know, what you expect from a, a, a much bigger, bigger brand. Um, so yeah, they're really, I think they're really smart and onto it. And I think they'll, they'll keep sort of doing really interesting things. We had a chat uh, probably about 11, <coughs> 12, 11, 12 episodes ago about what makes an independent. Um, one of the things that came up was was that interaction with the the people who run it and the kind of the connection to the to the watchmakers themselves. I think this kind of in, kind of highlights that you could be a an independent or a, I don't like the word micro brand, but I think you could be an independent brand at at all levels. And this is a good example of of that independence shining through. I think. Yeah. Oh, Kevin! Yeah, Kevin's yeah, getting yeah. one as well. Good job. Kathleen's met them. They're really great people. Wow. Yeah, mention our name. They might charge you more, but still. <laughs> that, they'll, uh, your watch will definitely pass QC. Awesome. No, they're lovely. Okay. Like, they're fantastic. Yeah, they're awesome people to deal with as well. So, yeah. No, wear is really fun. It's just a, a good watch to wear. It, I think you're right. Hitting the nail on the head. You know, it's a classic field watch side as well as that 36 mil. But without the military guff, you know, it's like a, that's a really cool thing. It's just modern. Crazy. That's what their logo, what's their, their, their tagline? Hang on, I'm going to read it off the case back. Is New Hands Old Crafts. So I think it's that sort of, you know, it's a, it's an old watch design and old values, but it's in, done in a bit of a new way. I think it works. Really nice. Fantastic. Cool. Good, good, good. Um, should we go on to the next watch? Well, yeah. Good, okay. Roman, sir, it is over to you. Tell me when you want me to proceed. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, beautiful. So I think, well, that's the watch, as Felix said, you guys just steal the reveal, but we might as well click on 
to the next one. Thanks, Chris. Um, so this is my watch that I'll be talking about. So it's a Jay and Shapiro Infinity Series watch. So it's the last watch that I've purchased. And it's kind of one of those things where it's the last watch I bought, but it's also the longest watch I've ever had to, like the longest period of time of gestation before I bought a watch. So this is the first time what I've actually sort of had a watch made you know, the watch kind of happened before it existed. So I sort of, I talked to Josh, who's the watchmaker in the corner there, uh, Joshua Shapiro, and then we kind of talked about it and then eventually led to this watch being made, which is very, which for me is kind of a collector or owner or whatever. Like it's a new thing. I've never done a commission piece before. So this is really, really exciting. Um, so it's a 40 millimeter case size. Um, it's a steel case as well. And we'll talk about some of the different components as well. Um, just for those who don't know, because I'm not sure how much exposure Josh Shapiro has had in the UK. So he's based in LA, um, Los Angeles, you know, the mecca of Hollywood and watchmaking apparently. Um, so he's, and he sort of really started off as a dial maker. So he makes handmade gear shade dials and we'll talk about his dials uh, in a sec. Um, and now he's sort of really expanding into, you know, at the moment he's sort of developing his own movements and really trying to incorporate more and more into, in sort of a manufacture. It's a little bit kind of what Felix was saying before about Anodain, you know, well kind of developing of an independent, you started a certain thing and with Josh, much like with Anodain, you know, there was dials. So Josh sort of applied himself to make the best dials, you know, in the world, if he could. Um, and I reckon he's in the top three dial makers, so certainly gear shade dial makers uh, at the moment he's working with other brands. Uh, so he's working with other independents as well now. Um, and then he's really slowly starting to kind of integrate more and more towards kind of a manufacturing kind of process. Uh, if we can skip to the next slide. Thanks, Chris. We can have a look. So that's sort of a close up of, of the dial. So you could see it's a, there's three gear shade patterns there. So you've got barley corn on the very outside, outside of the chapter rings. Um, you've got basket weave in the middle. And the, um, and the second sub dial is the uh, special infinity weave that Josh Shapiro had invented and kind of mastered himself. So it's a basket weave within a basket weave. And I'll show you that on the next slide in a sec. Um, but which is sort of never has never been done before. So to give you an idea on the size of the gear shades, each of those is about one millimeter, you know, per, per stroke. So when we look about a basket weave within a basket, we've sort of divided by a quarter, which is mental. Um, all of that is of course done on a rose engine machine for the curved things and a, uh, for the barley corn, for example, and then this, and the straight line machine uh, for the gear shades. Um, so it's a fairly classic watch, as you can see, fairly standard, uh, sort of fairly classic dial layout. Um, because it's a, because Josh makes sort of each watch essentially gets made to order. Uh, you can customize essentially whatever you wanted. You can have different colored chapter, so different metal chapter rings. So this one is silver, for example. Um, the sub second is yellow gold. You can have rose gold. You could probably have platinum if money was no object. You can have all sorts of stuff. Um, the other thing I really like is the hands. So you can see on the, so the hands are kind of blue, but they've got this sort of purplish hue to them under certain lights. And it's a little bit like the only other, and they're sort of heat treated as well. So they're heat purpled, if that's the thing, <laughs> like heat blued to the heat purpled. Yeah, heat uh, the only other purp yeah, heat, yeah. So the only other purple hands that I've seen, and I've never handled one of Roger Smith's watches. So Roger does a purple sort of thing. Now these are not the same as Rogers because they're actually blue, but under certain lights, they look purple. So, and you can see that's so I sort of tried to capture that. Um, the other thing on those, they're quite three dimensional, the hands as well. So they're not sort of flat. They're actually quite, they're rounded shanks with that sort of, um, you know, Breguet hollow tip style hand. Um, the other thing that's sort of unique to Josh, I guess, is that um, counterweight on the second hand, that sort of the infinity symbol as well that's that's quite neat um once again because it's customizable you, you know you can have those um cartouches you know the jane shapiro you can have it in different metals if you wanted to um the one at seven and the one at four um, you can have them on you can have them off so the one i had on mine is actually slightly different to the usual so usually he has california on one side and he's got engine turned on the other side uh which i actually got him to change for me to gear because i thought it sort of balanced the dial a little bit better um but 
but you can sort of do whatever you like. So it's, as I said before, it was a 40 mil case size. It's about 10 mils thick. So it's about, I think, slightly under. So it wears really well on the wrist, really beautifully sort of weighted as well. Uh, if we can jump to the next slide, thanks, Chris. Uh, we can have a look. So that's sort of the engine turn uh, pattern of that infinity weave. Now it's sort of, yeah, so hopefully that you guys can see that. So what I wanted to show there is kind of the three dimensionality of the, each of the engine, engine turn cuts. And you could sort of see certainly the basket weave, you can really see those V shapes of the, of the cutter, which often, you know, if you get pressed or CNC uh, gear shade dials, you know, the bottoms will be quite rounded. Uh, certainly with press dials as well, whereas what you can see on the on the on the engine turns is you get sort of that sharp V, and if you get a loop to it under certain lights, you actually sort of get this real glow as light funnels into that with internal reflections. It really funnels into that V, so it's kind of really beautifully done gear shade dial. Um, and as I said, I've got a few dials with uh, with um, a few watches with gear shade dials. So I've got a watch uh, that um, Johann Benzinger worked on. He's another German master as well and it's sort of a similar so you can really tell you know with a really good uh, sort of handmade engine turn you can really see those uh, the really cool things on that infinity weave that josh shapiro had invented you could see those basket weaves within a basket weave so the alternating three bar of the basket weave becomes four segments of the basket weave. and each of those i think is like point three of a millimeter all done by hand as well so you can imagine i believe josh i remember ch having a chat with josh and he was sort of saying you know it sort of takes i can't remember i think he said sort of can take up to a week to make that sub dial so and wow. the thing with guilloche that i really i mean that i admire i mean it's way beyond the realm of my own skill set but what i really like is that you're so balanced about you know so sort of like to avoid the pun, you know, it's a knife edge balance because each cut, you're one cut away from essentially stuffing it up and starting again because there's no do-overs. And, you know, you can imagine if you're getting to the end of this and then, you know, I'll presume if somebody slams the door <laughs> or your kid calls you, you know, you sort of wouldn't want to do a sharp turn <laughs> because, um, yeah, uh, that would be it. So, so, so this has never been done before. That kind of, that infinity weave, basket weave within a basket weave so he's invented that. I think he's in the process of patenting that. Um, even CNC machines can't do that because they can't program them to even fake this kind of pattern. So this kind of a unique thing that he's done. And when I sort of first heard about Josh, I mean, he's sort of, he's similar age to Felix and I and, and you guys, so he's a young guy as well, you know, which is really nice. I'll, I'll, I'll round us up as, as young guys, as most of our audience is as well, obviously. Uh, you know, it's, the watches are a young man's game or young woman's game, really. It's a young person's game. Let's go with that. Um, so he's a lovely guy, you know, similar age, uh, like, you know, so, and having got to know him now for over the last sort of 18 months or so, like, you know, we, we're sort of chatting a lot about watches about kind of life we have very similar outlook on some things i get to tease him about donald trump because he's in the u.s which is great i highly recommend it if the you know if you know anyone in the u.s perfect time to tease him about donald trump uh do it now um wasn't, wasn't, yeah. wasn't he a teacher or is he a teacher uh, he, yeah he's a prince so he was an assistant principal, principal. so yeah. yeah so um when i first met met him so he was doing uh, he was an assistant principal and also i think teaching a robotics class or something but he yeah. was doing he was the assistant principal in the morning i think it, uh, sorry in the in the afternoon so from like one o'clock till five and then he was engine turning in the morning self-taught engine turner as well I, be I believe so so yeah i mean his story is really interesting so i think he started making watches he started making skeletonized dials which is like which is very ironic because i think he used to really enjoy seeing the wheels spin under the dial and i think his thing was like you know for the longest time or for the first year or two he thought you know who in their right mind would slap a dial on on top of those beautiful you know wheels you know interacting and moving and then i think one of his clients wanted a uh, sort of a watch half skeletonized and half engine turned dial and that kind of led him down the rabbit hole of i presume george daniels looking at watchmaking that chapter on um engine turning and then kind of from there i think he found he met um david lindale who's a american um uh watchmaker who actually also makes engine turning machines because machines are getting hard to get so he actually makes guilloche um guilloche rigs as well so we've got, I mean, yeah, we've got chris really 
we've, we've got Chris on as, um, in the chat, actually, who's also been trying to find oh, some really? of those Chris, machines. Oh, really? Chris Manning? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's awesome. So, yeah, really enjoyed Chris's recent podcast uh, as well. Uh, hi, Chris. <laughs> Big fan. Um, yeah, so, so, so it's one of those things. And sort of the more I sort of get into watches, like I found coincidentally, or at least subconsciously, I've now accumulated a couple of watches with gear shay dials and it seems to be like hey i sort of had this realization hey i'm really into gear shay which is all right you know i can say that we, we're, we're sort of where you're not gonna you're not gonna judge me right this is like a support group right um yeah so it's really really lovely so yeah so so dials are really really cool can we swap can we jump to the next slide please chris um so this is the back obviously um so this is the movement so the movement that josh used for his watches is really interesting so He's an independent watchmaker. What he wanted was a movement that wasn't sort of a stock eater or unitas or something. So what he actually used is a movement called UWD 33, uh, which is Uhrenwerk Dresden. And pardon my German pronunciation. Now, Uhrenwerk Dresden is a sister company to, uh, to Langenheim. So Marco Lang set that up. So there's quite a nice, um, you know, sort of little sort of nice synergy if you like between an independent watchmaker doing independent dials and an independent um, german manufacturing making movements in small batches so it's kind of a real like i think it's a like i think it was a perfect choice of movement personally um this movement has uh, ha has been used in other watches but quite rarely so the only other watch that i'm aware of that this movement has been used in is the zin uh meisterbund which was a limited edition um what should they they released twice i think in like 55 units and then i think maybe in 70 units or something like that uh it was the same sort of movement so zin meisterbund uh but it's sort of it's sort of so quite an open worked uh movement beautiful finishing so it's machine finished uh but like i really like the um you know the it's very so the watch is very classic on on the dial side and then you flip it over and sort of quite classically decorated but really interesting movement really like i think really beautiful beautiful movement to watch it's a hand winder um 55 hours power reserve as well and it just works really really it works really really well um yeah nice blend of modern and that modern technology oh, sorry not technology but that modern kind of industrial look with with some very classic uh, Classic yeah, and as, as well. I think, yeah, and Robert, I think, just pointed that out as well in the chat. Yeah. It's really beautiful depth to the movement. You can really, you know, the way they've sort of skeletonized some of the cocks, if I may use that term, uh, <laughs> uh, it really adds this beautiful visual, um, yeah, like real depth, real depth to it. And they did really well. It's really nicely decorated as well. Um, so my watch, you can see there's a little gold, so it's a little gold plaque there, uh, which is hand engraved. So a guy who actually hand engraves them is Artur Akmayev. That's why I put his name on top there so he works with josh he also makes movements or he also makes watches of his own as well he does some really crazy uh, skeletonization really crazy engraving stuff like he's worth looking up on his own as well really really cool guy uh, as well young guy as well so it's good you know these guys hopefully will live long enough to service our <laughs> watches and look after them which is you know which is important but it's just a lovely sort of bunch of guys um you know, putting these things together. Um, and so once again, in terms, when I was talking to Josh about sort of getting stuff customized, I, I sort of asked him, you know, can you put my initials on, on, on the bottom and that, on that clerk there at, you know, six o'clock or whatever it is. And he's like, yeah, no worries. Tell us what you want to do. We can make that happen. So, and the more I sort of get into these independent watchmakers, I really enjoy that interaction that we like part of the stuff that we were talking about with Felix is that the, possibility of speaking to the watchmaker or the, per the people who are going to do the watch for you make the watch for you have a bit of a chat just kind of know where the watch is at what stage have the ability to customize if you want or not just a really lovely sort of human connection that really adds to it um, the strap he uses is also like a small um, strap maker um, in arizona and i'm just blanking on the name uh, I'm sure it'll come to me, but once again, it's one of those, you know, small operation, uh, Stone Creek strap, something Creek. Uh, so I'm sure it'll come to me or just Google it. Uh, it'll be easy. And the thing I really like about Josh is he's quite transparent about where he's, you know, where he's, uh, who he's working with as well on those. So, yeah, so that's, a, that's the back of it. If we just jump across 
Uh, so actually, before we do that, the, the book that was in the background of that picture, by the way, is a really nice book as well. Uh, it's it's a book on Guilloche if anyone's interested. So it's a Kalina Shevlin book on Guilloche. Well worth a read. You know, if you're a if you're an engine turning geek like me, that's always you know that's always well well worth a read. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's that's the profile of the case as well. Um, uh, we'll talk about the crown on the next slide, but you can see there's that because the watch is called the infinity series. There's a nice infinity uh, etched infinity symbol on, on the crown, um, uh, which is good because it sort of matches the, um, the counterweight on the second hand. I think I talked about that. Um, you can see sort of that sort of stepped nice brushing on, on the, on the watch there uh, to contrast with the sort of with the polished bezel on top as well. Um, and you can see the strap is quite quite slim as well, so it wraps around the wrist really nicely. So it sits, I said dress watch, it sits beautifully on the wrist. It's probably one of the most comfortable watches I've ever had. Um, James Lamb is the guy who made the crown. Uh, he's a good mate of mine now, or has become a, quite a good friend of mine now. Um, if we can jump on the next slide, please, Chris, and I know I'm rambling on, so I better go. So as we were talking about sort of having the ability to interact with the people making your watch. So as I ordered the watch and the watch and Josh was working on the, uh, on the dial and, you know, the, the movement was coming as well. I got to meet James, James Lamb, who is the guy who making the crowns. And I, and we were sort of having a chat and then he's like really funny, really lovely guy. And we were sort of having a bit of a chat. And he's, he, and so he sent me all these pictures going, Hey, you know, your crown is currently in progress, which is like such a lovely thing to, you know, it's like if you buy, like if you're collecting watches and I've collected watches, you know, I don't buy super expensive watches necessarily. Um, but, you know, I've never had that kind of interaction with a watchmaker before, you know, you know, I've, I mean, I, I don't buy Rolex watches, but, you know, I'm sure Rolex doesn't tell you one that the crown is being, you know, made or shipped from wherever they make them, you know, we don't want to get you guys in trouble. So made lovingly with shit. artisanal hands at the bench by the old guy who's been there for 60 the years or whatever. Well, maybe, you know, allegedly, you know. In, in, in China. <laughs> no, stop it. Oh, no, sorry. It's Thailand for cases and crowns at Rolex, isn't it? It's Thailand, not China. I, my mistake. And that's, how, and that's how we bring this whole enterprise down. You know, there's cease and desist letters and all that. So anyway, <laughs> um, but what, what, sorry, where I was going with this story before Chris just got us all shut down um, was when I was having a chat with James, as a joke, I said to him, you know, I'm getting this watch custom made. Can you customize a crown for me? He's like, absolutely. What do you want? So then I said, and then as a joke, I'm like, well, it's a stainless steel case. Can you make me a gold crown? He's like, well, I can make you a gold insert in your crown. He's like, do you want to do it? Because he's like, you know, not going to cost you any extra, uh, but happy to do it for you, mate, as a one-off. So I'm like, all right. So is that completely so, anyway, hidden from view? Yeah, absolutely. Exactly what I was going to say. So, so, so my crown so is stainless steel on the pointless. outside, but it's, yeah, absolutely. It's gloriously <laughs> pointless. No, no, so it's not gloriously pointless. It will be awesome for the watchmaker who's going to service the watch. We'll take yeah, it and go, oh, they'll nick it. They'll nick it. They'll put a stainless steel one back in and you will never know until the next time you get it. Well, you, that's also possible, but you know, it's, but, you know, but it's one of those, but the beauty of it, I thought it was like a perfect example of getting a watch made, which I've never done. You know, but it's just one of those like, let's explore where this goes. And they're kind of really bonded with James over this kind of, you know, we've had a bit of a joke about the same thing. No one's, no one is going to know. I'm like, I know, but you and I will know. It's a thing. It's a joke that we have. And I've probably got a picture somewhere in my phone of, you know, him kind of saying, hey, these are the crowns I'm making. There's like, you know, stainless steel crowns, gold crown, yellow gold. Cause he, and there's like one for Roman is like in its own little compartment being made like separately away. It's just okay. like, it's one of those really lovely touches but right kind of really makes this watch kind of made for me in a really nice way and it really exemplified kind of you know interacting with watchmakers interacting in a really really lovely way so and like my my i can sort of highlight as we were talking about the um you know the the experience felix has had with anna ordain of this sort of being this really lovely warm relationship between people i've had that with Josh as well, like, you know, we good mates, we have a chat about, we have a giggle. Um, I've shown this, I've shown the watch that I've made because obviously, you know, he's only made about, I think 20 or 25 so far. He's getting more and more exposure. Like he's done a recent um, series with the, um, uh, not collectability, with the guys in the US. He's done like a meteorite crown, uh, so a meteorite dial and yeah, all that. 
collective. collective sorry, that's a, yeah, thanks, thanks, Felix. Um, yeah, but like we sort of, I've shown this watch around because there's no other people in Australia at the moment who have it. But I'm really happy to show it off to people. Go, hey, this is a really cool thing that's happening really on the cool. other side of the world, sort of thing. Yeah, so it's, it's really just cool. a really lovely experience. And if we can just jump to the last slide, Chris, and, that, and then I can stop talking to save the people. And that's kind of the watch uh, sitting in its natural kind of habitat <laughs> while I'm working from home. You know, it's, it's in the door. It's, um, it's lovely to see a you know, proper handmade dial. I mean, Patek, Patek announced a thousand, a limited edition of a thousand to, uh, to mark their, whatever it was, 100 million Swiss, 800 million Swiss, sorry, new building. Um, and each of them is stamped. Even Patek is stamping their dials out. Hey, hey. But it's one of those things, yeah. what I really like is that, you know, with Josh's strategy, I think, look, I think he started with the dials. I think the plan was make the best dials I can make, generate some revenue, and then start getting into kind of in-house movements and all that. And when I was talking to him before, the movement, like Felix was saying with Anna Dane, in this watch, the movement was less important for me. I mean, the movement I think they chose is fantastic. Like, I think the UWD movement just fits mm. this watch, like, beautifully just thinking. But I didn't really care that it wasn't a Josh Shapiro in-house movement, because I think the movement they picked is really cool. It's, it's, it's nice, it's great, it has a story to tell, but the dial and the hands and kind of that whole ordering process really, yeah, just really. Me, so. As you yeah. said, nice nod to uh, George Daniels, Breguet before, and, uh, and many Yeah, Lepine before that. Like, it, yeah. Yeah, it's a real Roger classic Smith kind of thing, now. yeah, all the way. Yeah, that's nice right. to yeah, put yeah, RS on the back bad. as well for Roger Smith. That was nice, nice touch. Well, I, well, I'm I'm hoping to flip it to him to get one of his. Yeah. You know, it's 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 a long long term strategy. You know, I was gonna say I was gonna you know I was just gonna engrave it to you know number six eBay, but you know oh. I, I couldn't fit, couldn't fit all the all the letters in. You know, awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a lovely watch. Yeah, it's a lovely watch. Thank you very much. <laughs> I feel like all the comments, all the comments are saying exactly what we've been saying. You know, it's a beautiful thing and, and just oh, just incredible nice. work. Yeah, could be good. Thank you. Thank you, Roman. Uh, Matt, over to you, sir. Oh, quickie. Oh, my goodness, bring on. Another, another divisive brand. Um, this is, um, so this is a watch I picked up back in 2009. Um, this, I, I think this is an interesting thing because I think when it was launched in 2009, the Bremont Martin Baker uh, series of watches, the MB2, it was kind of interesting. Um, they'd worked with Martin Baker, the... Um, the ejection seat company um, to see what happens when you chuck a watch out of a plane, um, and 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 that's actually quite a, quite a violent egress, um, as you can imagine. You know, first of all, you've got to get rid of the, the canopy that needs to blow up and behind you, so you don't hit your head when you then go out uh, nearly vertically um, at a thousand miles an hour, whatever it is, away from the plane. And these are zero zero rated seats, which means that 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 as they have done in in the past, you may have seen you can eject when you're when you're on the ground and still be safe. Um, so, so they did a few things, and and the interesting tech for me uh, within this is um, that Peter Roberts, who was the technical director at the time, put two things in. One, a big rubber, um, basically, instead of having a, a movement um, uh, a movement holder, it's like a it's like a rubber polymer, so it stops the movement from um, from hitting things and kind of just absorbs some of the shock which is a really simple idea. And I think he probably stole it from Satina back in the 60s, 70s. Um, and secondly, it's something called the rotor click crown, which is the second of, the, of these crowns, yeah. the, the lower crown, which is an internal bezel, which almost you know, everyone has, but um, a nice, very defined click to it as you, as you turn it around. So this, um, this watch is based on the, the, the Bremer MB2. Um, it's called an MB1.5 by some people because it's a bit like an MB1, which is the, the watch you can only buy if you have punched out the plane. Um, so the yellow, if we just flick onto the next picture, the yellow um, pull, um, pull uh, handle, which is usually between your legs and the seat, um, you pull to eject, is that black and yellow band on the, on the counter of the second hand. And then you'll see there are yellow uh, markers at 5, 10, 15, et cetera, around the, um, around the, uh, the the minute track of the of the internal uh, internal bezel, um, and they're both taken from the MB1 watch. Um, we couldn't get uh, so the MB1 only comes with a red barrel. We couldn't get red barrels. So all of these came with orange barrels. Um, I actually swapped mine out. If we go to the next next one, um, I 
when I went to visit them, I asked them if they could swap the orange out for, for like an anthracite grey. I was wearing it at work and it was getting some strange looks. Um, I think it looks quite good. It's on a pretty yeah, shunky, cool. it's on a, it looks like quite a shunky strap. That's one of the original MB, um, MB1 straps that um, Carl at Gas Gas Bones used to make for them. Um, so it's been with me, actually I'm wearing it now. Oh, cool. It's, uh, it's been cool. with me for... Of like uh it's very much kind of do it yourself wasn't it <laughs> <laughs> kind of feel to it um back in the day i mean from a word kind of do, do it yourself people i mean they're only probably making two and a half three thousand watches at this point a year um i think they're up to a lot more now um i think i think, I think they're still friendly with with gas to gas bones as well i don't think i, I, don't I, think I, I hope so i would i would have thought so I mean, he's um carl's a, yeah. a, an awesome guy but i think the numbers just increased uh, yeah. to such a s scale that, it, that, you know, it wasn't really fair asking a guy in the shed to, to do them. But, uh, you know, I think as kind of the innovator of this star strap, he's, uh, he's done a fantastic job. Um, yeah. The, yeah, so this aluminium mid bezel is um, literally just kind of slots in. So this, it's a three piece case. Um, uh, I don't know if people know um, an Audemars Piguet watch called the uh, 1159. Um, but basically, I've they only copied, heard good things, but never seen yeah, one. They, they, they copied this um, this design uh, in, in order to, to, to do what they wanted to do with their case too. So, um, the, if you just um, go on to the next slide, the um, the case back has uh, six screws, as you'd expect, it's screwed in. But what that means is the lugs are effectively floating and don't uh, don't touch the the case back. Interesting. So if you look um, look above the screws at uh, well in this picture. You know, ten and two, the the lugs are, the lugs don't join the case, and that's exactly what AP had to do when they put a screw screw back on as well. Um, the difference is oh. AP, it's very tight, and this you've got enough room to put the um, the aluminium milled kind of mid barrel into it. Um, so that's kind of interesting, I thought. Um, yeah, Martin Baker rejection C MP one point five. This was um, a limited run of 20, uh, 21 watches um, by Alistair at ATT Vintage. Um, so they're relatively rare. I mean, when people talk about rare, this is rare because there are 20, 21 of them. Um, it's not on auction term, it's true. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's uh, it's fairly limited in number and um, I've had it for, yeah, it's a long time. Cool. I really like it, really like it. I've, I, I haven't dived with it. Um, I ski with it a lot and um, oh. uh, it it's, Effectively, it's almost like a um, almost like a NATO strap in that both of those there's little pockets for the for each of the spring bars, um, which is really helpful because quite often when I'm getting a especially if I'm going off piece and I've got a rucksack, quite often catch my watch on that and it can quite often pull off the pull off one of the, the spring bars and at least the, at least the, the it's then left just hanging on one. Um, so nice. I quite like that. Otherwise, I would have lost it a couple of times. Um, it's amazing how much force you put on you apply to a watch when you catch it in a in a rucksack when you're, when you're trying to jump out of a moving, anyway. Done, there, any questions? No. Do we know how Rob many of these the, they made, the one and a half, the 1.5? One and a half, 20, 21, 20 or 21. Oh, wow. So oh, wow. it was originally going to be 10, it was originally going to be 10, it got extended to 20, and I'm not sure whether they count mine in that 20 or not, because mine was slightly different. Because um, it was awesome. built in a different batch and then um, retrofitted back in because I'd already ordered a watch before it was announced. Um, oh, and then they had to jury it. Cool. Yeah. That's so, really, so, cool. really cool. Am I remembering correctly, Matt? They were slightly sort of um, reticent about doing it or they were a bit like, oh. Yeah, yeah so this is one of the first times they'd actually done it. I mean, they'd done a watch, a, a watch for the military, one of the flight schools, and they were starting off this kind of military um, yeah. business, but they hadn't done it for the civilians and I don't, they yeah, haven't this, really this, done any since have they they did one so they did they did a, a very limited batch uh, run on a on a S, BCS2 which I've also got they did one for and then they did all sorts of things they did a Selfridges watch in yellow they did a altitude uh, yeah, yeah. forum in blue yeah. they did then they sort of did them for retailers um, yeah, so top some beautiful retailers well. top time yeah, top, top yeah top ahead one top, Toppers? Yeah, top I had one. Top jewels, yeah. yeah. I mean, top jewels had one. I mean, they learned off the military, no, I mean, military watches, they did. Yeah. 
Cool. Yeah, it's very cool. Sparkly stuff for men, as Rob, uh, Rob Morrison points out. Everyone likes a bit of sparkle. Always <laughs> been knurling. Always been knurling. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. So from something that's very, very uh, uncommon to something that is incredibly common, um, uh, I have... Uh, so as, as Joe pointed out uh, early in the chat, today is Father's Day. So happy Father's Day to any dads out there. Um, this it was my dad's watch. So this is the watch I grew up seeing. Um, it's, I've talked about it before. It's the reason I have uh, a Speedmaster because when it was my 21st birthday, my dad was like, you're having an Omega? And I was like, I don't know what that is. Cool. Um, and I uh, kind of got into the, the astronauty kind of stuff after the fact with that. But this is the watch I grew up seeing and wearing. Um, looking through a journey through time this morning, they started production of this in 1965. He was wearing it when him and my mum got married in 1974. So he got it at some point between 1965 and 1974. Um, talking to her on the phone this morning, she tells me that when she met him, he was, uh, he was in one of various cars that I've heard stories about. So him and his brother used to uh, go and buy secondhand cars that were way beyond their means and then drive them until something expensive broke um, that they could not afford to fix. Um, not something expensive like an engine or a gearbox, but it could be that the car needed new tires and at that point it was time to say goodbye to it. Um, so at this point he may have been driving around in a, a gold-coloured Mark II Jaguar, possibly, which I've heard the story many times of having to be sold because it had got to the point where they were through to the metal on the tires and there was no tread left. Um, but he had this watch and when he met my mum it was on a blue shark skin strap. Um, she told me that it was pretty disgusting and pretty worn out. Um, and when they were on honeymoon uh, on Malta in 1974, uh, he went into a jeweler's and bought this um, Omega Milanese bracelet, which is on a number 27 deployment clasp. So you tend to see those on like dynamics and stuff. It's that big chunky deployment thing with weird screw in ends. Um, they, they made this watch in a few different colors. So there's, there's ones with blue details, ones with red, you see some with black. There's two different hand types. Uh, some have got um, Breguet numerals instead of applied markers. There are automatics, manual winds, date, no date like this, all in the same kind of case. Um, in 1970, and this is something I learned this morning, which blows my mind a little bit, the Geneve model line accounted for 60% of the unit sales for Omega. Wow. So for all these stories you hear on forums of like, oh, my dad had a Speedmaster, my dad had a dive watch it's much more likely that your dad had one of these because they sold so many of them. Um, so th these were not like unobtainable watches. My dad was a, um, he was a civil engineer. So he was involved in like building road layouts. He worked for councils. He built car parks, kind of, you know, those kind of unsexy things that you kind of need for society to, to function in the West. Um, and th this was a watch that he went out and bought. Um, it's got some, some kind of nice details. It's quite a slim watch. Uh, it's manual, uh, it's an automatic wind, automatic movement, but you can manually wind it to get it going. Um, I think it's about a 35 millimeter case, 18 millimeter lugs. Um, as you can see, the deployment clasp is thicker than the watch. So it's not a massively big watch. Um, it's got a caliber 552 in there, which is quite a nicely finished um, automatic wind movement. Um, I don't think this watch has ever been serviced and I will get that done at some point, but when you move the hands, the second hand goes backwards, which is not a good sign. It does need a watchmaker to have a look at it. Um, and uh, it was at a point where you could say waterproof on things and no one told you off. So this is long before water resistance. So I think this is kind of one of the, the early-ish um, pieces they made. As you can see, like the finishing on this is not sort of super top end. This is very much like an every man's watch. Uh, this is the thing you kind of uh, you, you'd go in and buy without having to remortgage your home, um, and it had no branding on the back at all. No, no, just said waterproof. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's like super sterile. You got to think like entry level. Go entry level. They had like at this point. I can't in the remember. Range, I can't, but that's the point. Yeah, entry level Omega doesn't because because we're used to seeing it as a luxury brand. We're not. You know, I'm, I'm right. only 40, 40 odd. So uh, this, but, you know, I'm not used to seeing it as a, you know, I can't think what an entry level Omega is. I mean, now it is uh, a DeVille. So there's some DeVilles that are... Which are luxury watches. Yeah, they're two and a half thousand pounds, I think yeah. they start at. Um, so... Auto SMP. Yeah. So oh, this, yeah, good point. Yeah. yeah. So th this is like, this is a watch that any of us would have gone and bought. This is pre-Quartz crisis, you know, people were buying 
mechanical watches as, as a thing to tell the time with. That was how they worked. It wasn't like a status symbol. Maybe it was a bit of a status symbol, but a lot of it was like, I just need to know the time. So I turn up for work on time and I don't get fired. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they made a lot of these. There's another interesting detail in the journey through time that the version of this with the date on towards the mid 1970s, if you'd been working for Omega for a year and you were a man, they gave you one. and That was your watch to wear then. Uh, if you were a lady, they gave you the equivalent value as a credit against another watch in the catalogue. And it says the most popular watch for ladies was uh, the newly launched uh, Dynamic, which is the, the one with the, the ergonomic case that's supposed to be like the mm -hmm. most comfortable watch ever made to wear. So it's, I find it quite interesting. Like if you were a man, you got this. And if you're a woman, you got a credit and you could pick something. Um, I wonder if they had a few few more of these to, to move along than they perhaps wanted. Who knows? Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so it's on this Milanese bracelet, which you tend to see these on chrono stops, which I've had one of, and they are much mm. thicker. And, and it, on a chrono stop, this wears in kind of a weird way because the movement is chunky um, and the watch case is then chunky. And this, this bracelet kind of pulls in quite close. On this watch, this bracelet almost feels too big, even though it has the same 18 millimeter lugs and it's the same 35, 36 ish millimeter case. Um, mm. But this is definitely the bit of the watch that fascinated me as a kid because I begged my dad to play with this thing and just want to play with the, the bendy, funky bracelet. Um, and it still kind of fascinates me now, like how these things are made. Having seen how they're made now perhaps fascinates me even more. Um, but yeah, that's it. It's, it's a watch that sits in my safe that needs a watchmaker to look at one day. Um, mm. Sentimental value. It's, there's lots of them out there. That I know people collect them. I don't know why, but... It's the, it's, the, it's the blue luminous material, or is it just blue on the dial? Uh, I'll go back to it. It's, so they're blue markers, so it's, it's a piece of, it's nothing flashy like onyx like you get on, on constellations at the time. Yeah. Um, I think it's, a, it's probably a piece of steel that's then been overprinted with black and blue, and then there are loom dots on the outside. Just behind the, yeah. Yeah, so oh, it, yeah, on the outside, yeah, 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 and then there's the same loom in the hands. So, again, we're, we're very much like in what was the entry level of Swiss mechanical watchmaking from what was still considered a, a good brand at the time. You know, this is like I, I'd looking at catalog prices at the time, you would have paid a lot less for this than you would have for um, a, a Rolex uh, Oyster, you know, like a, a, a date watch. Um, these were probably about half the price of that, I think. Um, I mean, what's yeah. really interesting what's really interesting is that you could see that there's a lot of thinking and a lot of care went into designing this dial picking just the right shade of blue you know typography and everything this is this beautifully balanced dial i'm not sure i would say the entry level product offerings from most brands now would get the same level of thinking behind it now because it just looks like this was made with a lot of care and it was you know really thought about they you know because they knew yeah. they were going to sell a lot of them because i think it's a beautiful sort of beautiful thing which i don't think the current entry-level offerings from a lot of brands receive the same amount of attention at least in the design of it so it's a beautiful Ooh. thing the other, the other way i was just thinking uh, along the other lines um is that the handset is a you know in the center there it's a lighter shade of blue is that because they went to you know a third party hand supplier at that time and sort of didn't quite color match or is it a yeah. design decision i wonder probably because the red doesn't color match either so the red hands yeah. and and I, I guess it's like one company was making dials one company was making your hands hands i would have probably... 60 self the red hands <laughs> yeah and it's probably like <laughs> this is the color and they'd match it as close as they could. Um, uh, the, minute know, markers like are, the minute markers are the same blue as um, Omega Automatic in Geneva. Yeah. yeah well, so the, 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 the dial printing would have been so, done at one place. Yeah. Exactly. So, so you've got dial printing. You've got the you've got the the indices which are different blue. You've got the hands which are a third yeah. shade of blue. Yeah. I think uh, probably the, the standout quality piece in this is the movement. So the 500 series movements are really nice. They're they're in house Omega at that point. The finishing is nice. Um, Bill says it should be a 552 24 joule. It, yeah, it is. It's a 552 in there. Good spot, Bill. Um, Bill's yeah. forgotten more about Omega than you or I will ever know, mate. It's true. It's absolutely true. Um, but yeah, this is like, so this is one of the two watches that if the house was on fire, this is coming with me. And it, it's purely sentimental. The other is my Speedmaster, which is also purely sentimental. Um, How are you going to carry the cat? I think he'd, he'd, he'd look after himself. You can always get another cat. These are getting harder to find. You can always get another cat. That's the well, last time you're coming on the <laughs> <thing. laughs> 
<laughs> that's fine. I'm sure I'm burning bridges everywhere. That's fine. <laughs> not burning bloody cats, that's for sure. <laughs> There'll be no burning cats. No eating radium, no burning cats. Um, I'm going to... After all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this has been uh, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing good. that, Chris. Really appreciate it. That's yeah, all right. Brilliant. Um, Kathleen says, do not burn cats. See, I'm with Kathleen Lewis. Do not eat oh, radium really? or any luminous material. Do not burn cats. Uh, I'm not saying burn cats. I'm just saying if you've got hand, your hands full, you've got to leave something. So uh, Brian says, Brian says, he says the cheese Swiss made tea. It says this, but it's on the, it's just yeah. on the bottom it's, of the die. You just can't quite see it in the curve yeah. of the, yeah. uh, And then uh, Rob Morrison said, in paint colours, blue is the hardest colour to keep stable over time due to UV. Ah. Might this have changed? I'm not sure, to be honest, Rob. I've seen new hands and new dials that don't match. So, right. um, and I've seen lapis. I've seen lapis paint in Egypt that's a little bit older than this. So, you, there are ways of doing it. That's for sure. Yeah, I think it's it's a thing of like at that point. I'm I'm fairly certain saying at that point most Swiss Swiss watch manufacturers were buying parts in Switzerland or at least in Europe, and it's just a case of like one company made dials another company made hands it's it doesn't nothing. matter no one it was it was like like you said it was a tool that people wore to go to work it didn't yeah no one was looking at these things with a loop other than the watchmaker that that made them or repaired them it was you bought it to tell the time cool um thank That's you to everyone good. for joining us today this has been a lot of fun um thank you to felix and to roman for uh, for staying up a little bit late um to, to hang out with us very much appreciated thank you for sharing your watches thank yeah. you for having it's been a real yeah. honor and a pleasure thank you thanks for thank our you. first australian only get together we'll, yeah. we'll have to get yeah. down yeah. Person or will we, there be another one did we just burn bridges or will there be another one <laughs> just without you about cats, Roman, you're not coming back <laughs> not saying one with me i'm, I'm sure i'm never going to be here so, again uh, give, give these guys podcasts a listen ot <laughs> podcast is awesome they've just had uh, the guy who sold the Paul Newman data turner. Yeah, that really good. Data turner. Really good. Yeah. Uh, Fifth Wrist. Fifth Wrist gave us a shout out, actually. They're awesome. Listen to them. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Um, awesome. Thanks to, to Matt for some wonderful co hosting once again. Um, thank you to everybody that's joined us in the chat and hung out with us. Uh, thank you to everybody who's watching this on YouTube and uh, hopefully thinking that they missed out and they want to come to a future one live and hang out with us. Definitely did. Um, thanks, so Danny. much banter that didn't make it onto the final video. Exactly. Right? <laughs> Huh, those edits. I can't believe you said that about those people. Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. Hopefully you'll edit all of this out. Enjoy the rest of your day, guys. <laughs> Happy Father's Day to everyone who, uh, who celebrates it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Thank you. Have a good Thank afternoon, you. everyone. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Okay. Bye.